Good morning. And uh, I have to say, it was, it's, it's nice to be introduced as a quasi-regulator. I, uh, I uh, find that, uh, I take that as a compliment, actually, because it, you know, as you know, the Coast Guard really is a, an operator first. We're a seagoing service. Uh, I've spent time at sea myself, and, uh, and I think that that gives us uh, some insight into the challenges, uh, not completely, but it gives us at least some appreciation for the challenges faced by uh, the maritime industry. But of course, we are indeed a regulator as well. Uh, so I, I'm going to talk to you this morning about the drivers of regulatory change. And as, as you know, the uh, U.S. Coast Guard uh, oversees the maritime industry for the United States of America. And we also represent the United States to the International Maritime Organization. And while it may seem that uh, agencies like mine initiate change and drive regulatory change, we're actually responsive to external stakeholders and external forces that demand that. And those demands come uh, from many directions, but they principally come in three forms. Uh, they come from the public, uh, they come from the industry, and then they come from regional changes. And, uh, and we'll speak a little bit more about the Arctic. That was mentioned earlier, and I'm pleased to hear such attention paid to that. Uh, I want to uh, also congratulate all these award winners this morning. That, uh, that was impressive. It's impressive to see uh, that kind of innovation and that, that, uh, that talent uh, directed towards, the, towards answering that what's next question. But I'm going to argue that it's important for us to think about these uh, drivers, these three categories of drivers I've just described, uh, as we, and that we work together to address the challenges associated with it. Because answering what's next is always better and a little more comfortable than answering what just happened. So that said, let me move on to this first one. And what I've got here is a slide uh, illustrating, uh, I think, one of the strongest demands from the public, and that is for uh, actions to address uh, problems in the environment. Now, what, what this illustrates really is, is the, from the early 70s into the present, the increasing challenge and the increasing complexity of environmental concerns. It starts with the uh, oil uh, prevention regulations at the bottom and then moves up through the various increasing challenges. And the question mark at the top is all of those things that we know are yet to come with respect to things like greenhouse gases, uh, perhaps uh, black carbon and others. Uh, and then the increasing uh, slope of that curve is, is to indicate that this becomes uh, uh, significantly more difficult as we get into the more challenging arenas. The, um, as it turns out, it might have been the oil spill regulations might have been the easiest of the things that we've dealt with over the, over the years. But what I would tell you is that the public demands that we pay attention to this, and, and you all know that, and this has been, been well covered this morning, uh, the goal is to do so in a, in, a, in a transparent way, in an accountable way, and in a collaborative way. Uh, agencies like mine uh, cannot write regulations without your help. And, uh, and as you've already mentioned this morning with respect to things like uh, air emissions and ballast water and the like, uh, a panoply of answers coming from regulatory agencies doesn't, doesn't address the very real concerns uh, that you have with respect to predictability, consistency, and, uh, and an understanding of, of what needs to be done. If I move to uh, an industry segment that is driving a lot of change, um, I'm going to take the energy industry as an example. And what you see here is really just a slide meant to illustrate the dramatic changes that have occurred in the uh, offshore oil production business over the past uh, 20 years or so. And, and again, this is not meant to be inclusive of all of the uh, types of uh, new drilling operations and drilling rigs and drilling technology. But what it does show you is that we've gone from very shallow water drilling to very deep water drilling in a, in a short period of time. And as I mentioned to uh, a group yesterday with whom I was speaking, if you were to draw a line on that chart where the United States uh, regulatory stance is currently, I'd put it closer to the 1980s line than I would to the 2000s line. And and that's perhaps a, a both a, a statement about my own agency as well as a statement about the rapid and, um, and dramatic changes in that industry. The, it's important that we understand uh, these changes and the risk profiles as, uh, that they've changed because failure to do so can lead to significant disaster. Uh, the other changes that have occurred that have been mentioned before are with respect to shale gas development, uh, development of LNG as fuel, and, uh, and of course, even offshore wind energy, which poses uh, other uh, problems to the maritime industry with respect to navigational safety. 
But as I said, uh, if you don't understand these challenges and you don't understand the risk profile and how it's changed, the difference between drilling at 5,000 feet of water depth versus 200 feet of water depth, uh, it can lead to disasters like the um, Macondo spill. And, um, and this is not where you want to find yourself uh, discovering. This is, this is an answer to the what just happened question. And, uh, and it generally drives um, more dramatic kinds of responses and less reasoned responses. And then finally, let me move to the, um, the Arctic, uh, which has been uh, covered in some detail. Let's see if I can get it to pop up. So what this slide shows you is the minimum ice extent uh, in the, the summer of 2012. Uh, the red line at the top is the northern sea route across, uh, across Russia. Uh, the blue line at the bottom is the uh, Northwest Passage. The green areas indicate uh, fisheries and, and where we think the fisheries uh, may be migrating. And then the red areas indicate um, known oil deposits and reserves, not those that have yet to be discovered. The, the world has indeed uh, opened a new ocean, and people are moving in. And they're moving in in fits and starts now. You heard that there were 46 vessel transits uh, last year across the northern sea route. Uh, we don't know how predictable that sea route's going to become and how, use, how much use it's going to have. But uh, I can tell you that if we don't pay attention to this now, uh, we will have to pay attention uh, to it later. And uh, we've spent a fair amount of time uh, in the Coast Guard uh, looking at Arctic issues over the past year and a half. And, um, and in fact, just recently published uh, an Arctic strategy for the Coast Guard that's first ever. And, and it has three primary objectives. The first is a very straightforward one. It's to improve awareness of what's happening up there. We, don't, we as, a, as, as, a, as an agency, don't really know what all is happening there. We're aware of, of drilling efforts and, um, and transits, but we don't know what the, what the long-term plans are. So to that end, we're working very closely with our counterparts uh, around the Arctic uh, through the Arctic Council as well as uh, through various other forums to, uh, to begin to develop that awareness. But we're also interested in developing some, some actual governance regimes for that. Uh, and that leads me to the second um, priority that we have for the Arctic, which is to modernize the governance regimes that, are, that currently exist. Uh, as you know, there are, there are certainly existing uh, law that covers maritime operations, but, but it's, it's largely untested in the Arctic region, and that there are some still areas of, of concern and dispute and, and perhaps um, of uh, lack of clarity. Uh, particularly when it comes to things like response to disaster, whether it be a, a rescue case or, or the potential for um, oil spills and, and or maritime casualty. Uh, how do you respond to it? Who responds to it? What are the coordinating mechanisms and so forth? And then finally, uh, we need to, in order to do that, you need to um, expand your partnerships, uh, both uh, amongst uh, government entities as well as uh, amongst the industry. Uh, many of you will be the first to operate in the Arctic. It won't be people like me who find themselves up there. We generally go when, when, when things go wrong. Uh, but we have to be there uh, because we are responsible for uh, maritime governance for the United States of America. So I would argue that, uh, that it's, it's important that we do this in a smart way. We have the opportunity to think smartly uh, about what's next in the Arctic and, uh, and not have to respond to disaster. Uh, generally, uh, as I said before, that's probably not the most uh, useful way to go about determining how to, re how to react to that. And so with that, I think I'll, I'll close and, and suggest that we have a real opportunity to, to work together. Uh, it's certainly the goal of the Coast Guard to collaborate with industry, to work together with industry, uh, to find reasonable solutions, good solutions, uh, open solutions, and predictable uh, playing field. Uh, our goal, it really, it really is to level the playing field so that uh, those of you uh, in this room who are the good operators are not disadvantaged by those who might take advantage of the system. So with that, I thank you, and I look forward to uh, the uh, panel discussion. Thank you.